grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, so yesterday, something very strange happened. We're changing gears here. You got to go with me. Something very strange happened in the Daney household. We had a day with nothing on the calendar. Do you ever have those days? They're few and far between for us too, and that's why it was such a strange thing yesterday to have nothing on the calendar all day, and so our family uh, kind of just enjoyed a day at home. We just kind of laid low. Well, all of us except Jill, because if you know my beautiful bride, she doesn't sit still very well, and so she decided, I'm not sure why, um, she decided that it being February, now was the time to take down the Christmas village that lives in our corner cabinets in our dining room. Um, they, it hasn't been taken down. I was trying to convince her we're already two months into the new year. There's only 11 or so more until, I mean, nine or so more until we're ready to put them up again. Just let it rock, right? Just leave them in there. But she decided to take them down, which then, of course, had an effect on me that I spent part of the day reflecting on Christmas. And so it's time for me to confess to you, I kind of miss Christmas. Am I alone? Who, who right now is missing Christmas? Like you miss the lights and the family gatherings and the presents and the, just the, the good cheer of Christmas. You all with me? You missing Christmas? You know what else I miss? I miss one of, the, uh, one of the great culinary delights of the universe. Do you know what that is? See, I knew you were gonna say eggnog. And I do love eggnog, and eggnog might be the greatest beverage ever created by human beings, and yet, that's not what I was referencing today. Nope, today, I'm referencing this. Do you know what this is? It's fruitcake. Anybody miss fruitcake? Anybody? Raise your hand if fruitcake is one of those things that you just cannot wait to have every Christmas. Raise your hand. All right, leave it up. I'd like you all to note that there is one person in this building who has her, two, who have their hands up. Um, for you, fear not, God still loves you in Christ Jesus, so let's take solace there. For the rest of you, we need to help this person understand that this is not generally a gift that we cherish. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, the rest of us, if we get this as a gift at Christmas, we find someone else to gift it to. That's how this thing works. Okay, uh, quick little disclaimer for you. Did you know that it is virtually impossible to find a fruitcake in Cape Girardeau in February? Thus, this isn't fruitcake, it's raisin bread, but it's close enough, right? So I'm keeping it because I do like raisin bread. But the point is, uh, and the question is that I want you to wrestle with, uh, is this of much worth to you? Anybody? I was going to auction it off, but no. Would you consider, let's position it this way, would you consider taking this beautiful loaf of fruitcake, a.k.a. raisin bread, and trading it for all of the things that God has in store for you? Any of you? Anybody ready for that trade? No? Why not? You wouldn't trade this one loaf of raisin bread for all of the good things that God has for you. You wouldn't? Of course not. You would be foolish if you made that trade, right? You would be absolutely foolish if in the midst of God and his great love for us, God coming to us and calling us his special people and giving us a special relationship with him and teaching us what it means to follow him and providing for our every single need, we would be foolish if we traded all of that for a loaf of raisin bread, wouldn't we? And yet that's exactly what happens in Hosea. That's exactly what God's people have now done. If you were with us, we've been hanging out in this weird prophetic book called Hosea. The first couple of weeks, we, we hung out in chapter one, 
where we talked about this strange call that God puts on this prophet Hosea, in addition to what he normally does with prophets of teaching them what to say on his behalf. In Hosea's case, he not only teaches Hosea what to say, but he takes his whole life and turns it into an object lesson. He tells Hosea to go find a less than desirable, less than faithful wife and have less than faithful, less than desirable children. And they're supposed to marry and be great together. And somewhere between chapter one, when Hosea does that, and chapter three, which we're gonna jump into in a minute, somewhere between those two things, Gomer, Hosea's wife, has run away and has found love in the arms of another man. She is not only unfaithful, but has abandoned him. And God comes to Hosea again and gives him another message, this time similar to the first one that he gave, and yet subtly different. Here's what God says in Hosea chapter three. And the Lord said to me, meaning Hosea, and the Lord said to me, go again, Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of evil, of Israel, excuse me, though they turn to other gods and love, here it is, cakes of raisins. Now maybe you read the text and you were like, what on earth? What is with this cakes of raisins thing? Let me just fill in that gap really quickly. Cakes of raisins were offered to the Canaanite gods. It was part of the worship of the Canaanite gods of the surrounding territory. And so what's happening in this text, God's people who have all of the goodness, the richness, the abundance of being God's people have turned away and have favored other gods, that they've traded this identity as God's people for raisin cakes. Seems pretty ridiculous, doesn't it? In fact, you might be tempted to sit here this morning and think, those bunch of knuckleheads. What? Well, you know what's coming next, right? So what's your raisin cake? It's about to get really deep, and I'm going to need you to stay with me. What are the things in your life that overtly or subtly you look at and you position just slightly above God, that you turn into worship, that you turn into an idol. Well, what's your raisin cake? What, what's your fruit cake, if you prefer that analogy, Gina? Now, now to be fair, Every pastor who's ever preached on idols anywhere has gone to what I call the A-list. You know the A-list? It's money and your reputation and all of these easy things. And I could certainly go there. We could talk about all of those things, how we turn our reputation, our standing into the in the community above our desire to be faithful to the Lord and his calling. But to be fair, those are too easy. So today we're going to the B-list. What about those things in your life that that are harder to pin down. You know, that, that maybe look really good on the surface and yet we're still capable of turning into idols. Those things that aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves, but we have to be careful as God's people that we don't elevate them slightly above God's will and wishes for us in Christ Jesus. And for us to go through that list, I'm just telling you it's gonna get a little rough. The goal of this is for you to be honest with yourself about what you're baking, so to speak. So let's run through a few lists. Is it possible that you're creating a raisin cake out of your family? I said, these things aren't overtly bad, just that we can subtly position them in a higher standing in relation to us than what God's desire for us is. Is it possible that we turn our family into something that becomes more important than our identity and relationship to Christ? Is that possible that we guard our families? Is it possible that we maybe seek family time watching a movie or whatever versus uh, the, the role God has given us as Christian parents and grandparents to teach the faith? 
Is it possible that we desire for our kids to be successful in life and to have great careers and get into good colleges and make lots of money over being faithful to the Lord? Is that possible for you? That the goal of successfully raising your kids is that they're successful versus that they're faithful? Because if so, I hate to tell you this, you're firing up the oven. You're prepping some cakes. You with me? Just chew on this a little today. Is it possible that, that soccer and athletics fits into that category in your home? As one of our eight o'clock people said to me this morning, hey, pastor, I uh, think you're going to have a low attendance today. And I said, why is that? And he said, everybody's worshiping at that big church down by the highway. He didn't know what we were talking about today, but that he offered to me freely. You know the big church we're talking about down by the highway, the one that says sportsplex on it. Is that possible, that maybe our priorities are out of whack with our kids? Is it possible that we seek self-improvement, self-growth, self-health above following Jesus, that, that it becomes this thing that narrates our life? We always want to be better. We always want to read uplifting things, and we always want to be at the gym. Is it possible that that can get in the way of our relationship with the Lord? Is it possible for you that that's a raisin cake that you need to kind of start paying a little more attention to? That this one's kind of become a crusade for me. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. It's a small little word, but it is insidious in the American psyche. How about safety? Is safety a possible idol for you? Like we as Americans are conditioned that we should seek safety, and yet what if safety gets in the way of you being faithful? man, God's really put on my heart a particular neighborhood in this community, but I can't go there, Pastor, because it's unsafe. Man, I really want to go to Tanzania or Guatemala or Kansas City or wherever we go on on our mission trips together, but it might not be safe, Pastor. And if that's you, if that's keeping you from what God has put on your heart, guess what you're doing? You're baking raisin cakes. You tracking? Just a quick little aside for you to break the tension. Last fall, you know that we sent a team to Tanzania. What you may not know is about three days before we left, do you know what the news covered? That there was an Ebola breakout in Tanzania. And our team had to gather together and say, are we still committed to going even with this disease that will kill you in the country? How would you answer that question? That's a tough one, right? Not just so you don't think we're super pious because you'd have stayed home. It was in a different corner of the country, and so we took a calculated risk. We knew where it was, and we knew we weren't going anywhere near it, but you still have to wrestle through. Is safety an idol for you? Uh, They get harder. Um, How about traditions of the church? Remember, good things that we can turn into idols. How about traditions of the church? Is it possible that those become distraction idols for you? A few years ago, true story, we had a person in our traditional service uh, who was here faithfully week in and week out until suddenly he disappeared one Sunday. And when we called on him, the reason that he gave for leaving us was because one Sunday, I'm not making this up, one Sunday, we didn't say the Apostles' Creed. One Sunday. And he left his church family because that was such an important thing That's an idol, friends. It's a church idol, but it's still an idol. You tracking? Is it possible that we turn the rhythms of the church into our own little idols and we feel really good about them because they're church? Except if they take our eyes off Jesus, they're idols. I told you this is a harder list. We could keep going. We could talk about nationalism and patriotism. We could talk about civic action. We could talk about a whole variety of things. The point is this. Don't sit here in judgment over the Israelites when you, too, bake raisin cakes. And so do I. We we don't get to just push it off on history like those foolish Israelites. Guys, we're just as guilty as them. 
We're just as guilty as seeking self-worship, self-importance, self-priorities. We're just as guilty. In fact, this week in our staff worship time, once a month we get together for just us, just our staff, to have a little worship time. Kristen picked the song, the hymn, Come Thou Fount. Do you all know that hymn? If you grew up in the church, at least this branch of the Christian tree, you probably know that hymn. My family, when we were talking through this yesterday, they said, so pastor, they don't call me pastor, but you do. And they said, are you gonna sing this? And I said, no. So fear not, I'm gonna sing it. I could ask David to sing it for you. He probably knows it. Maybe I'll feed him the words, because part of the words that you sing when you sing, come thou fount in a traditional setting is prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. See, we know that we're just like the Israelites, right? It it might be hard to hear this list of things, and we could have done more. We could have talked about our time. We could have talked about a variety of things. The point is this. We're just as guilty, and we need to be critical of ourselves. We can't sit here all puffed up and comfortable, which is another one of those raisin cakes. We need to be willing to be honest and to say, God, are we putting anything above you? And if we are, forgive us. You know the good news? He does. That the good news is that he does forgive us. In fact, the context for this quote about raisin cakes is him coming again to Hosea. Remember, his wife has again gone away from him. His wife has again turned her back on him and gone to a life that she loves. Her wife has found her meaning, her purpose, herself in the arms of another guy, and God says to Hosea, go buy her back. And he does for six ounces of silver and a bushel and a half of barley. He goes and buys her back and restores her to the relationship that she's supposed to have with him. Even though she is perpetually unfaithful, we've talked about that this whole series, he is called to be perpetually faithful. That's what loving husbands do. They buy back their wives. They sacrifice themselves for them. Now, maybe you've been tracking along and you are now putting the pieces together because they're not super hard to put together. If we're the unfaithful wife who keeps running away, God's people, Israel, the church, and God is Hosea who's sent to buy the wife back, that means God buys us back, right? Isn't that what we celebrate and sing about? I mean, if you strip it all away, isn't that why we're here? To celebrate the fact that we've been bought back by the very life, death, and resurrection of God's own Son, Jesus. We too have been bought back at a far higher price than six ounces of silver and a bushel and a half of barley. I want you to note, however, that the reading doesn't end there. Right? We have this, this lesson of God sending Hosea to buy back his wife, which he does for that price of silver and barley. But then in verse 3, he says to her this, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So I also will be to you. In other words, I'm going to buy you back. I already have. I will. You're my wife. You're important to me. But now because I've bought you back, I want you to seek to actually live as my bought back wife. Don't just cast it off and be like, woohoo, this is a game, and run out the door again and go find someone else to sleep with so that I have to buy you back again. Instead, live as my bought back again people. I want you to actually live in this relationship as my wife. I want you to stop your promiscuous activities. I want you to be the spouse that I have purchased you to be. We don't get to just keep on sinning. 
under this banner of grace, we don't get to just go, woohoo, and run off and find someone else to sleep with, physically or ideologically. The quest now for us as the redeemed, bought back people of God is to try and live faithfully as his spouse, the, bro- the church, his bride, the church. That's the quest. That's the goal for us, is that we acknowledge our raisin cakes and we, and we quest to not make them or run after them or worship them or be consumed by them any longer, but instead to delight and find our meaning in who we really are, the loved and bought back people of God through faith in Jesus Christ, this amazing price that God paid for us. It's who we are. And because we've been bought back, because we've been restored to a new relationship with him, now we seek by the power of his spirit to live that bought backness day in and day out. Amen? Let's pray. Come on. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, thanks for your grace and mercy to us. Thanks for going again, for coming again to us, to love us. Lord, we're prone to wander. We're prone to turn our back on you. It's part of being a human being and even good things in our life, God, like family and sports and time and other things. We've we've exalted and twisted and turned into something of worship. Lord, forgive us for that. We don't want to turn to other gods. We don't want to love cakes of raisins. We want to be your people. We want to stop playing the whore. We want to stop belonging to any other. Lord, may your spirit convict us of our idols. Remind us of your great love for us and empower us by your word and your love, by the power of your love, Lord, to be the people that you have called and claimed us to be. Let that be our identity. Let that be our narrative. Let that be our everything. We pray this in your name, Jesus, knowing you love us far more than we could imagine. Amen.